Okay, can you all hear me? Oh, good. Well, good morning. I want to tell you that I'm very happy to be here for many reasons. I've really enjoyed my visit to Belgrade and will continue to do so. I want to explain my topic. When I looked at this organization and got to know some of the people through email and, and looking at their pictures, I realized that I was going to be talking to a set of very young, <coughs> young and energetic people interested in bright new products and things like that. And I said, what can I offer to this audience? And I realized when I saw some of their publicity that they were calling me a pioneer, which I believe is the Serbian word for old guy who needs help up the stairs. <laughs> and I said, what can I tell you? And the obvious message is that I could tell you is that you're going to get old too. But the other message that's much more important and that I know much more about is that your software is going to be old. So I want to talk about how software gets old. And just to be constructive, I'm going to want to talk about what you can do to slow the aging. We all know we can't stop the aging, but there's a, sorry. the motivation of my talk to put in, in one bottom line is that in my career, I've seen several generations of software start out as bright new products that people thought would last forever. And suddenly they were labeled legacy software. And a legacy in the computer field means a curse. And I want to show you how to, you might be able to avoid some of that. So that's where we're going. The first thing when I have this title is I realize to a lot of my colleagues, especially some of the academic ones, they will tell me that I'm talking about nonsense. Why is it nonsense to say that software ages? Because software is a mathematical product. Mathematics doesn't decay with time. If a theorem was true 200 years ago, it's going to be true tomorrow too, I hope. If the program is correct today, it'll be correct in a century. If it's wrong 100 years from now, it was probably wrong today. The text is stored digitally so it doesn't fade or blur. We can make perfect cl clones and move from technology to not technology. So how can software age? Well, if you want to think of it as a mathematical thing, it's because the theorems change. What we expect from the software is one way that changes. As those things change, the code starts to become more complex. The original creators disappear or do not understand what they have written anymore. That's happened to me. And slowly, we find that as the software is continually ad adapted to new things, it seems old. It may not be aging. Maybe this is not a good analogy, but it looks like aging. And the other thing is that it cripples once proud owners. I know several companies started out with great products that beat the field and they're bankrupt and out of business now. It gave them a wonderful market share and a really good reputation, but they began to be unable to keep up with the younger products. They couldn't change their software. So I think we have to think about this and what we can do about it. Now the first thing is just to have you ask yourself the question, can my product be immortal? I, I know from, from having been there that you look at new software and you, you look at the old ones and say, oh, that's so old fashioned. It was, our product is going to be better. It was written with some new language and a new agile method. It uses deep learning. Whatever the current buzzword is, people believe that their software will be young forever. And I think I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. But the good news is that you can postpone that day and uh, maybe your software will end up in the museum that some of us saw last night. But I felt they were going to lock me up in there. But, but uh, the other thing is you may be able to leave something behind for your software's children. We'll talk about that too. So first of all, 
we have to understand that there are two distinct types of software aging. One is the failure to keep up with the changing environment. So sometimes somebody gets a product, they like it, they're used to it, and they never change it. And one day they look at it and it's, it's no longer uh, of really relevance to anybody but them. The other way that software ages is when they do change it. And this is what I want to talk about most because it's like what they call in boxing a one-two punch. You're faced with the need to change. If you don't change, you get old. If you do change, you affect the software in such a way that it gets old. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. There are also certain diseases that make software seem old. And these are usually not aging, but birth defects. They're things that people did wrong in the beginning. And it's important to know the difference. So, lack of movement, the not uh, changing, comes from not recognizing that your customers change. Uh, we're just not willing to use yesterday's software interfaces. I remember when to use a computer, I had to sit down at a card punch. I imagine there are very few people in this audience that remember what a card punch was. And make little holes in pieces of cardboard and then carry the box of those cards over to another machine that would read them in and it was on and on. And then I got 15 minutes on the computer and then they kicked me off. And nobody would put up with that today. Uh, it's just not, not possible. And there are many other ways that we expect things from software that people would never have thought of today. And that's one reason why products that were considered great a few years ago are now dead or dying, lying on their back, waving their hands. Now, <clears throat> there's one strange phenomena that I have seen a few times is a product that seems to get better with age. Now, this could happen because it was ahead of its time but it actually happens because the users learn. I saw one uh, product, I won't name the company, partly because it's represented here, but they presented a paper about a product that had, whose performance and failure rate had gotten better steadily for two years. And then they revealed that they had not made any changes to the code. What happened is that people knew which buttons not to push. They knew what things caused it to fail and they avoided them. So there's a place where you have a sort of a pseudo youth. Now, the next thing that happens to software is what I call ignorant surgery. What happens is usually when you design a new product, you have a concept in your mind. You have a vision of how it's organized and how it's, uh, 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 what should be where and which part that is responsible for what, what the interfaces will look like. But if you're successful, people take over that product. And in most cases, people do not manage to communicate the concept that's in their mind to the people who end up maintaining the product. And then they start making changes that are not consistent with what's actually in their uh, in the original designer's mind. And slowly, and I've seen this happen very often, you end up with a product that nobody understands. The original designer no longer understands it because it's been changed and the concept is not there. And the people who changed it never really understood it. So you, you're always looking around for, oh, I think Johan understands that or something like that. So this makes this product much harder to change and it's one of the forms of aging that I, I see most often. The problem is made worse if the maintainers do not update the documents. The document becomes increasingly inaccurate and very often it becomes so inaccurate that it's worse than nothing. Because if you look at it and you believe it, you're gonna be misled. And I've had uh, people in companies tell me that they spend three quarters of their time, because they're maintainers, trying to find out how it was supposed to work so that they can fix it. There's also uh, a sort of a form of aging that looks like cancer. It just, the software continues to grow. Every time there's anything wrong, instead of figuring out why did we get that wrong, 
or what did we assume correctly, incorrectly, and revising that, they add a patch. And you get layers and layers of sort of mushroomy flesh on the software and it leads to, again, harder to maintain slower software. Another thing you find is that people maintain many different versions of a product that are almost alike. And one of the things you learn as you get older is that almost alike products really lead to confusion. You know, if on one product you have to click on the left, another product you have to click on the right, and you're maintaining both products, after, after a while you have to stop and really think, which one am I working on right now? And often you take an idea from one and put it into the other, and it doesn't work very well. So all, again, becomes difficult to keep up with demand. Another thing that happens, and this is also something that I've been sad to, sad enough to uh, experience in my life, is that programmers disappear. Well, the most pleasant cause is that they move on to other projects. Sometimes they become sort of useless and are promoted to managers. Uh, sometimes they actually forget what they did and why they did it. I can personally attest to that. People change their style of programming and then they start mixing up the old with the new style. Some of them go on and form a new company. Some of us retire or slightly better, just die. And <laughs> even with the, uh, the best documentation, those who created the original product are usually better at fixing it than their replacements. And one of the most interesting uh, things that I saw in my lifetime, many of you were around for that, but some were, are, are already too young to have been involved, was the year 2000. And suddenly, all the old dinosaurs came out of the woodwork and began to work on the COBOL programs. And uh, they could fix things and find things that their, their younger, energetic colleagues had no idea how to fix. Another symptom, but I want to warn you this is not it's something that looks like aging, but it's not. And the reason that's important is you fix it a different way, is what I call kidney failure. This is when you have what other people call memory leaks in the software. Software seizes some memory and doesn't give it back, and after a while there isn't enough memory and the thing slows down. That's not an aging problem. That's probably a drinking problem or something like that. And all that happens is that you have to rewrite a little bit of code, usually find the places that are not doing their job correctly and fix them. It's much easily corrected than actually aging. Now, the biggest and most obvious cost, and the one that uh, really, th really hurts people, is rapidly rising maintenance costs. Now, one of the things that I find is that it's something we do very badly as educators. It's something that we do very badly as companies. We don't make people aware that they're going to have to maintain their software, that it's going to be maintained. Somehow they think it's going to come into being and it's going to be perfect and it's never going to have to change. And, for example, I don't know very many universities, in fact, I only can think of one right now, where they actually teach people what to do when maintaining software. I knew a very wise man who was the head of uh, software for, he was actually a member of the board of directors for the world's largest private insurance company, the German company Allianz Versicherung. And they, uh, he said to a group of people who were asking what they should teach their students, he said two things that I thought were really memorable. The first was, I don't care what programming language you teach them. I've counted, we use 1,700, you'll never get it right. But I do want you to teach them how to fix an old program. And I thought about this. I'd been teaching programming for many years before I heard that talk, and I realized that I always let my students start a new program from scratch. I never gave them a program that had something wrong with it and asked them to fix it. So after I heard that talk, in what who had just stopped being East Germany, I said, wow, I, I went back to Canada and I changed my, my introductory course so that at some point I handed them uh, a program that I told them what it was supposed to do 
and I had uh, many different versions with many errors because the one thing we learn how to make as we get old is errors. And <coughs> I gave them this and asked them to fix it in my presence. We had a big room and we made them fix it. And I was amazed at how badly they did the job and I realized I had to modify my courses just to teach them that simple idea about how do you go about figuring out how to fix something and what's the right way to fix something, what's the wrong way to fix something. The other thing I've already mentioned, it's the inability to keep up with your competitors. And I saw this big time in the, in the telephone field where you'd get a company that was pioneer in the field like AT&T and slowly it found younger companies able to bring new features online much faster than they could and they really worried about it. Well, they, AT&T split up. The younger companies have also died. It's, it's going through three generations. And the main problem was that they couldn't keep up with what was other people were able to do easily because they didn't have old software to repair. Also, as you watch a software, it often reduces in performance. It doesn't take advantage of the new hardware. As you, uh, as you add code and data, it starts to slow down. It's amazing how bad it is. And the final symptom that bothers me is decreasing reliability. Each error corrected starts to introduce another error, maybe more. So that as you improve it, it actually gets worse. And at a certain point, the wise company simply throws it away because they can't fix it. And I very much doubt that many older people are surprised. Everybody probably knows a case like that. So it's time for us to grow up. And by growing up, I mean we have to get over what we believed about programs when we began. Now I always know a new person in the programming field when he runs into my office and says, look, it runs. And I say, how often have you run it? Once, it runs. You know they have no experience. Right? That's, that's right away. But it's important, and we have all learned this, it's not that it's right the first time that matters, it's that it keeps on being right. So we have to accept the inevitable and not promise any one product immortality. What I've seen kill a number of, of companies is that they offered somebody a product and they didn't put in the contract, we will only maintain this for 10 years, 15 years, some number. Doesn't matter what it is, but there has to be an end because you just do not want to commit yourself to maintaining a product forever. And people have to be able to plan on the replacement. I mean, you buy a car and they tell you we'll give you a four-year or a five-year warranty. And you know that eventually you're going to have to pass that car on to your child <laughs> and they can fix it. Right? It's, and so you have to begin by recognizing that. The second thing you have to do is to start to prepare for handing over. One of the things that people seem to have a lot of trouble with is replacing an old system with a new system because people don't want to lose all their data. I've seen this happen over and over again with email systems. The new email system is great, can do lots of things the old one couldn't, but I have tons and tons of files of correspondence with people I can no longer read. But as been wise products have prepared so that you can extract all that they've provided a, a Passover or an inheritance interface where you can get all the data out and then the new product can incorporate it. And I can tell you I've seen systems over and over again where people have not prepared for this kind of, of event where they will give up but they still want not to let their customers down completely. Maybe they want to get them to be customers for the new product. So they have to have a way of getting the data out of the old product and into the new product. There are ways to think about that. So this leads to my little motto at the bottom of the slide that software geriatrics, preparing for software to get old, begins right at the beginning with what we call pre-birth, where we provide interfaces for the moving on to the next generation. Now one of the things that I, as, as somebody who's been around for a while, emphasize more than most other of the so-called gurus in the field is the importance of discipline. 
One of the things I know is that shortcuts are always tempting. Always. You're always sure, I know what I want, let's just write the code. This is obvious, let's just write the code. And it's never right. I've, I've seen that, I worked on military aircraft, but I've never f f uh, flown an airplane. And, uh, you know, I have trouble finding the, the check-in counter sometimes. So, what, what happens is that you think something is obviously the right thing to do, and then you talk to somebody who uses it, and they tell you it was obviously the wrong thing to do. I remember once passing a group of users a list of my fundamental assumptions, the things that I was assuming would never change. And somebody, other people marked up individual ones, but one very smart person just crossed out the word assumption and wrote misconception. And said I had a list of fundamental misconceptions and then explained why. So you can't skip the stage of working with people about requirements because what's obviously right is, is wrong. And even if you're right, if you don't write it down, the other programmers won't know about it. So I'm just telling you this because there's no cure for it. It's, it's very funny coincidence, but when I prepared these slides, I remembered a time when I had taught a class in the morning and uh, in the afternoon met with a project team. There was a problem in the project and I had this brilliant idea. I said, let's do this, it'll fix it quick. And there was one very bright student among the group who looked at me and said, Dr. Parnas, you know you're telling us to do what you told us not to do this morning. And I looked at him and I felt really bad, but I, we didn't do it, I'm glad to say. And I'm really glad that he was there. And the reason I say it's a strange coincidence is that yesterday, the first time in my life, somebody introduced himself as the brother of that student. So I told him I was going to mention his brother in my talk. Now, how do we, what do we do about it? The first thing is what I call design for success. Because I have known products that never had to change. That's because nobody ever used them, nobody ever liked them. Any product that's used is going to be changed. And what we have to do is design it so it will age more slowly. Now there's a bunch of principles that have been around almost as long as I have. The one I call information hiding, which many of you know me of, abstraction, separation of concerns. Other people have called it data hiding, though I don't particularly like that phrase. And object orientation, which is a way of building the, idea, the other ideas into a, a programming language. These are, in my mind, all five ways of looking at the same principle, all of which are useful, but it's basically the same idea. What design for change requires is thinking about change. You have to look at all the things that you're going to build into your product, not just the external things, but the internal things, and try to characterize uh, what's likely to change. Now this goes against what I was taught in my first programming course and what is taught to Generations of people after that begin by designing the st data structure or begin by designing the algorithm. To me, that's wrong. The first thing you begin by is saying, what's likely to change? Because this will guide you in many ways into how to structure the system. And you know how we say we have to document the requirements. This was a, a great religion for a while. Part of the requirements is changeability. And you can't design software so that everything is equally easy to change. So you have to think about what's likely to change and what's not likely to change. And you have to estimate the probability. Now, one of the things you can say is, I don't know. And you're right, you do not know what's going to change. And you certainly don't know what's, what's going to change, but I can tell you that you will do a better job if you try to guess and do some, look at older systems and try to gain, talk to older people. I'm still around, I'm a consultant. You can ask me what's likely to change, I'll tell you, because I've been around. And <clears throat> you, can, you can do that. You'll do a better job. You won't do a perfect job, but you'll do a better job if you just ignore the whole issue. And then you organize the software so that you can, con what is called, confine or encapsulate likely changes. You provide interfaces that abstract from the thing that's likely to change. 
and in more modern but still pretty old tech terminology, you implement objects that hide changeable data structures and algorithms. The next thing to talk about is what to do when you actually make the change. And the first thing is don't make the easiest change. Look at it and say, now I have to change this. What should I have done if I'd known this was coming? And try to go back as far as is practical. Sometimes you can't go all the way back. And build what you wish you had built the first time. And as you make your maintenance changes, you work towards that goal. One very obvious thing is when you have to change a data structure, if that data structure wasn't hidden by uh, an abstract interface, then add the abstract interface now so the next time you have to change it, you can change it. So that means when you make a change, you hide it. And you define and document the interface. Now, if you're looking at me, you're seeing an old man talking about old principles, and somebody says, well, we've been doing that for years, and it doesn't work. Look, we still have all this software that's hard to code. But it's not true that you've been doing that for years or that the industry has been doing that for years. Because every time I look at a piece of software, which still happens, I find things that were not hidden. Maybe people were so sure that it would be done that way or they'd seen another system done that way. I find that we don't teach people to do that well enough. We, we don't teach people to ask the question, Will this change? If you can't think of a good reason why this won't change, it will. Now, the important thing is don't be impatient. This is one of my criticisms of the agile field. I think they're too impatient. They're looking at too short term. And defining an, address, uh, an abstract interface that won't change is difficult and boring sometimes, but it has to be done. We saw that great music piece at the beginning the first thing they put up was a deadline. And this deadline idea often forces you to do things that uh, will cost you in the long run, may even cause you to miss your deadline. Another thing that happens that you have to watch out for is that designers mimic older designs. There are things in software today that have been inherited and inherited from old, old products. Products that were written before people understood how to write products. And you have to think each time, why am I doing it that way? You know, the other day we were talking about the design patterns book. But for each pattern, it's something that people do. But you have to ask why and what it achieves. And maybe it wasn't the right pattern. Just using a pattern doesn't mean you did the right thing. Right? So we also find that many software designers are self-taught. I often comment that I live in a country where you need a license to cut hair, unless it's just for your husband or something like that, but you need a license to be a barber, and you can work on a nuclear power plant or a military airplane without any license or training at all. Reviews are very important. You have to get people with other points of view to come in and review what you're doing. I've written a couple of papers that I obviously can't explain today on how to do active design reviews so that people actually look at what they're doing and actually ask the right questions when they're doing the reviewing. And the time you spend on reviews with the right people and the right methods will save you so much time in the future. And you have to remember, you don't have to be able to predict the future because you don't have to know what the change will be. You say, I've got a t-shirt this year and it's blue. Well, you don't know, you, the only thing you know is that color could change. You don't know whether it's going to be red next time or orange, but you better prepare for the fact that it will change. And that's true in software all the time. There are many times where you know that this representation, this data exchange format may change. They may add bits to the internet address or something like that. You don't know what they're going to do exactly, but you do know it's going to change and you better prepare for that. One trick that I learned very early in my life is that when I finally think I know what the requirements are, I take them down and I write two lists, which I call complementary lists. One is all the things that are likely to change and one are all the things that I think won't change. And then I pass them out to people who know the field or know the application and they always come back changed. 
Now, here is a thing about people. Many people are afraid to be wrong, so they don't tell you this is, this is, is what will change. But if you show them, they like telling you that you're wrong. Everybody likes finding an error in somebody else's stuff. So you, when you put these things in two fundamental lists, as a complementary list, everything in either will change or won't change list, they'll be happy to correct you and you'll get a better design because of it. You can always to do things to uh, slow the deterioration, even after you've built it, by introducing hierarchical structures, by, again, always by documenting. I've given, this is the third talk I've given in Belgrade, and the dirty word document has been in all of them. It's really important. It's easier to say than to do. There's always pressure that says, everything's going well now, don't bother worrying about the future. But you can read your Bible and remember about the seven lean years and the seven good years. This may be one of the seven good years and there will come a lean year. So try to find a structure that will hold for all the versions and work towards it. Don't take the structure that only works today. The other thing is, and I've said this so often this week that I'm getting tired of hearing me say it, keep good records so that the people who come after you know why you did something. It's so often that I've seen people on teams say, we're going to change this, and then somebody comes along, often me, and says, do you know why they did that? And they say, no, it was just stupid. And I'll say, no, it wasn't, and here's why. And they'll go, oh, right? So you want to make sure that you document not only the interfaces, but the reasons for both doing things and not doing things. In my projects, I try to get students to keep a list of ideas that they rejected and why. Because I know that within a year, somebody will come up with that same idea, and if you tell them why you reject it, they won't save a lot of time. Now, one of the things I find that the reason documentation is a dirty word is because it's often very bad documentation. People can't find what they're looking for, it's not in there, it's not correct, it's not consistent. So we also have to think about ways to do good documentation. Now, documentation, as people heard me yesterday say, is not an attractive research project, but I think we need to do it. I'm hoping, um, my favorite software guru is named Dilbert. Uh, he's a cartoon character invented by a guy who used to work for a telephone company or a um, communications company is probably a fairer word, and he quit in order to criticize his managers by drawing these cartoons. I've seen them in many languages. I hope you've seen them too. But one thing you can learn from Dilbert, it's like having 10 years extra experience if you read all the Dilbert cartoons. You can see all the things that go wrong. And you can see what happens, for example, if somebody goes in the hospital 10 days before a product is due, and nobody knows what he was trying to do. That's what, which is what this, this card is. Now, just a, a quick glance at what I mean by documentation. We wrote documentation for several products that looked like this. Big, thick book. Did I do something wrong? Or, okay. Uh, almost no English in them. In fact, I could tell you that most of this book is in Serbian. Now, that doesn't mean that I know Serbian, but I use, like all Serbs, I use English names in my software. But, um, but it's all mathematics. But it's mag mathematics organized into tables that make it easy to use. And I claim this is something that anybody who wants to keep their product from aging needs to learn to do. They need to remember that one day somebody's going to want to uh, replace one little, change one little thing. They need to find the place where it can be changed to know what you intended to do, to change it and to document what it'll do from now on. So one of the things that I find is people often let the changes get ahead of the documentation. It's so tempting because your customer is going to be using your product, doesn't care if you document it or not. But the next programmer, which may be you, is going to care. So. One of the things I like to point to people is that good documentation is never bulky. It's always really lean. And this is an example 
of two pages that replaced 21 pages at a company that I worked with in Limerick, Ireland. They gave me 21 pages that they thought was really good documentation. We quickly found holes and errors and inconsistencies in it, and we replaced it with two pages, and they never used the old documentation again. And the secret of the two pages is that they were formally organized. So the important thing to remember is you don't just do documentation because your boss or your customer told you to. You do it so somebody can use it. And you think about what it's going to be like to go into it. The last thing I want to talk about in connection with aging is amputation. There are times when you just have to throw away parts of your software because they got too complicated. It's a hard decision to make, just like it is in the body but sometimes it's the only way to save the life of it. There's also restructuring. I have seen one example of a major telephone product that was restructured. They, uh, the way they put it to me was, we know that what we've created has become spaghetti code. We can't make it perfect, but we can make it lasagna. And they ended up with layers of dough se separated by some sauce. So, Sometimes you need to do that. And when you do it, you have to make a trade-off. You have to ask, how long are we going to still be maintaining and selling this product? And whether it's worth restructuring or not. Now, I'm coming back to the same old theme and I'm going to be very quick. If you make good documentation, it'll be used at least six times. It'll be used when you're doing requirements. It'll be used when you're doing design reviews. It'll, your programmers will use it. I was proud of two things about the one document that I showed you. The users were aircraft pilots and they found 500 errors. Why was I proud that they found 500 errors? Because that meant they could read it and they did read it. And, and that's a good sign. The other thing that I was proud of is that when we were writing the code, I looked on the desks of the programmers and the documents were there and there was no dust on them, there were coffee stains. When a document has coffee stains, it means it's being used. Now, I'm showing my age when I say that because you don't want coffee on your computer screen. But you know what I mean, right? You've all seen... I learned this, by the way, from a housekeeper who told me when she had to cook for a family, she looked for the cookbook pages that were dirty. So, the final thing that I really need to talk about is retirement savings plans. You can't go into a product where the expectation is going to last forever. You have to start making sure that you're building up a budget that will allow you to change it and replace it. There's a few things that I've observed over the years that I want you to think about. The first is that creating a new system is much easier than uh, uh, changing an old one, making a major upgrade to an old one. It always is because you have to understand the old one. What is really hard is when you try to merge two or more systems into a new one, because then you have to know all about the old systems, and they often do things in very subtly different ways. And uh, so, so replacing an old system is often much harder than expected. If there are Canadians in this audience, they know exactly what I'm talking about, but a large number of our public, federal public servants are not getting paid properly because of things like that. There's email systems that are still being used that were supposed to be replaced years ago. Once in a while, in fact fairly frequently, you see a failure in the news, but most of them are hidden. People do not like to hang out their dirty laundry in public. So whether or not you think you will have to do it, plan for it to be replaced because it will have to be. Last point I want to make is, I'm not talking about agile, met agile methods. I think of agile as like a sprinter. It can get you to the first product fast. But that, I think, while useful, is deadly because you need to be a marathon runner. You want to have a product that will support you in your old age. So all the things that the agile people tell you not to do I'm pretty much telling you to do, and you're going to have to choose. I guess the other big thing I want to say is a lot of people look at ideas like this and say, 
well, the big guys don't do it. Apple doesn't do it. Uh, Microsoft doesn't do it. Uh, I've seen some Microsoft things they call documentation in connection with an EU lawsuit. They just didn't do what I think they should have done. And everybody says, they don't do it, and look how many billions of dollars they make. The trouble is, you don't have their customer base. You don't have as many customers, and you don't, uh, you, you don't have the reputation. You haven't addicted people. People are addicted to the big guy's software now. It's very hard for them to change. So they can get away with doing things that are really very costly, but it doesn't matter because they're making so much money and they have so many customers, and you're going to buy it no matter what they do. So if you think about this talk, I'm, give, I'm trying to give you a voice in the past about the future. People have called me, the people in this conference have called me a pioneer. I don't think of myself as a pioneer. I think of myself as a software voyeur. I spend a lot of time looking at other people's dirty software and asking why did it get that way? What could they have done to prevent it? And I'm now trying to pass that on to you because I've seen too many products that change from a beauty cream to an old hag. And <laughs> I just think it's foolish to, to pretend that it won't happen. So in software development, as in real life, you have to plan ahead. That'll take time and resources. If you don't do it, you're going to regret it. If you do it well, you'll be very happy. Thank you very much. Kavala. I, do we have time for questions? I'm, I'm happy, but I don't know that. No, no time for questions. You'll see me outside. And I'll try to answer your questions. Again, Kavala.